Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today we have Tim Denning with us. Tim is an Aussie blogger who's been writing for the last seven years with work most notably on LinkedIn and Medium. He's also written for Business Insider, CNBC, and Entrepreneur.com. But he is one of the top 10 in Medium's leaderboard, which is quite impressive. That's in terms of reach. He's also listed on Medium as a top writer in 15 categories, including entrepreneurship, self-improvement, social media, books, psychology, relationships, startup, productivity, and investing. So he is a real wizard when it comes to Medium.com and LinkedIn. In fact, he's just launched a LinkedIn course today. So Tim, it's so great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Stefan. Uh, obviously, we connected offline, but it's good to uh, connect in an official capacity. Yeah, well, I, I believe there are no coincidences, so it's great that we were introduced. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just could tell that you were meant to be on my show, so thanks for coming. Ah, great to be here. Well, let's start, first of all, with LinkedIn, because, after all, you just launched a LinkedIn course today, uh, so congrats on that. Thank you. What is it about LinkedIn that other social platforms don't provide that makes it such a a compelling opportunity for for marketers? Yeah, I think Stefan, something that I learned just a couple of days ago, which blew my mind, is only two percent of LinkedIn users actually post content on LinkedIn. So ninety eight percent of the audience are just passively consuming content. So for us content creators, that's kind of a goldmine. And then you compound that with the fact that it's got a massive reach. I think they're at 700 and something million users at the moment. Um, and you start to have a pretty interesting opportunity. And then if you look at the people that do post content, most of it looks like an ad. It doesn't look very organic and it's not high quality content. I often say to people, the definition of an ad is just low quality content because when an ad is really good, you don't really call it an ad. Um, and so that's the opportunity I think on LinkedIn. And then I've also kind of narrowed it down further and went, when you go on LinkedIn, one of the problems is that there's so many different mediums that you can do on there, whether that's audio or video or doing short sort of um, Instagram type stories on there. And so it's overwhelming in terms of the features. And so what I've tried to do is dumb that down to like, what can you do right now that most people are able to access? And I believe the answer to that is writing. Um, and then once you've built a foundation of writing on LinkedIn, um, that then gives you the platform to then go into those other features. Um, and that's what I've done. I've been on there for seven years using it. Um, and what I like is it's a, a heavily qualified audience. If you look at, you know, the income potential of the people on LinkedIn, you know, you're talking to executives, you're talking to sort of the average user who's on kind of a six figure salary. You know, if you've got a business and you're trying to kind of add value back into the world, I think that's a, a really high quality audience that you can access but it's a smart audience. And the trouble that people have is that the voice you need for LinkedIn is very, very different. And it's taken me seven years to figure out what that voice is. And that's what we sort of teach in the course, um, you know, in a, in a lot of detail. Where if you compare that to say Facebook or Instagram, it's a bit more casual. It's pretty straightforward how you would talk on those platforms, but LinkedIn, it's, it's a completely different uh, kettle of fish. Yeah, we're gonna have to go into that. But first I wanted to clarify, when you say start with writing, do you mean, the short micro posts that end up uh, being most of what you see on on uh, the feed, or are you talking about LinkedIn Pulse type full articles? No, so the full articles on LinkedIn, that feature was deprioritized a number of years ago. So I strongly recommend to people in the course not to use that feature. Uh, and so I haven't used it for a long time. So what I'm referring to when I say writing is those short text posts. And then for those that are a bit more advanced that can, you know, are quite handy with a camera, maybe to add a picture below that text, but that's really, you know, the, the sort of pro level. And so by using it, that kind of philosophy, it's much simpler to master the platform. And then from there, obviously, you could, you know, do some videos. Um, but with LinkedIn, it's maximum 10 minutes on the video. So you can't use podcasts. You've got to have something that's highly edited and that's really engaging. All right. So do you uh, recommend incorporating some sort of hook or some sort of bait, like clickbaity type uh, element into the post so that it makes it really intriguing for people to read? Yeah, probably don't go down the clickbait path, but we definitely encourage people in the course to really focus on the curiosity factor. Um, and that comes down to the basics of storytelling. And that's 
with a lot of these platforms, if you're a good storyteller, then once you understand how the platform works and you combine those two things, it's very powerful. So a lot of it is just storytelling 101. Um, but at LinkedIn, the what we call the rate of revelation, so the speed at which you have to tell that story is much faster and that there's a little bit of an art to how you do that. Um, so that, that's the secret to it, I suppose. Okay. And when you say it's much faster, you mean there are fewer steps to go through the hero's journey or the, the storytelling, like three-act structure? Yeah, because it, obviously you're limited to 1,300 characters in these text posts. And you've also got to remember that the users are using a mobile phone. So even the way you format it and the way it looks, it has to be perfect for the phone. And the attention span on social media, as much as I hate to admit it, it's just very low. So if you've got a story that's too detailed or it's got huge chunks of text, it's just not going to get the engagement. Uh, so we really kind of simplify that down and use lots of examples so that people can practice and get really good at that. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. All right, so circle ba circling back to the point you made about the voice not being casual like on Instagram, the voice being very important and... Uh, a little bit hard to master. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, so I think what you got to remember when you're on LinkedIn is that the average user, they're, they're thinking about LinkedIn in terms of their bosses sitting behind them and looking at them and going, all right, what's Tim engaging with? What's he doing? You know, was he doing that LinkedIn post on his lunch break when he shouldn't have been? Uh, and then me as the user, Tim, I'm looking going, how do I look in front of my boss? Do my colleagues think that I'm really good with what I'm posting? And, and so it's almost like kind of explain, it's like being in the lunchroom of your workplace. You wouldn't walk into the lunchroom and start talking about how you went to a strip club on the weekend, or you wouldn't show a photo of you topless at the beach or something, right? You just wouldn't do that because it's the home, it's the office. So you're talking as if you're in the office and you're thinking about, you know, what makes you look the right way or what makes you a thought leader so that when you're in the office, that kind of rubs off in meetings and different clients interactions and that's what people forget they, they forget that they're in the office and they talk like they're at home and it doesn't work um, and then the other thing is just around the language so you're looking at you know if i'm telling a story like you've got to keep changing the the way that you frame the story so if i'm talking about the near miss that i had with cancer in 2015 if i explain it like that on linkedin it's not it's not the correct format the way i would explain it is i was on my way to work X, Y, Z happened. I went to the doctor and I found out that I was going to have a near miss with cancer. So I went back home. I didn't go to work the next day and, you know, it changed my career path. So I'm still, still telling the cancer story, but I'm saying career, I'm saying work. I'm framing it in a work context so someone doesn't read that and go, hang on, what the hell has this got to do with LinkedIn? So it's all about the way that you frame it. And my sort of advice is like anything can be framed to work. You know, there's, there's nothing that if you've got kids and you're telling a story about your kids, you can tie that back to work. Because when you're playing with the kids, you did that at work or you weren't at work when you were playing with the kids or you're on the, on the weekend, you went on a holiday and that's because you got annual leave and then you use that annual leave to go on the holiday and you learn these things while you're on the holiday. And then when you came back to work, you started thinking about work differently. Right. Work-life balance just the framing. and everything. Yeah, it's so yeah. smart. It makes yeah, it so relevant. Yes. It makes it relevant. It's very subtle, but um, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Now, there's a point here I want to uh, make about what you're describing. It's about not trying to be liked and not trying to be disliked. You're you're trying to add value with what you're posting. And so many people, they care about what their boss thinks of them, their coworkers think of them. They feel like they're being watched and uh, they're being judged. And that that limits them, that changes yeah. their voice, that changes the whole point of why they're posting. And I, I think that's a mistake. You want to comment yes, on that? Definitely, definitely. I think one of the biggest challenges I see on social media and particularly on LinkedIn, and sorry if I offend anyone in the audience, but there's a lot of people sort of walking around talking about this personal branding revolution. And if you see my stuff online, you'll see I'm the opposite of that. Because to me, personal branding, what it stands for in self-improvement terms is it stands for selfish. It's about you and your brand and what, what are you going to get by sharing that content. So what I teach is not personal branding. I teach the opposite, which is what can you do to help the audience? And that's a selflessness approach to marketing or, or content creation. And that's probably the biggest secret I have. People go, oh, how do you reach these audiences? Is it 
who you are. I said, no, it's because I'm not trying to be famous. I'm not trying to like, you know, take cheap shots to, to get someone's attention. I'm just trying to share things that I think will help them. And that's my only goal. And if that, you know, helps to build an audience or an email list or whatever it is, that's great. But that's not my first priority. And I'm happy to do things and like not try and monetize everything. But when I go on LinkedIn, I see all these people with these businesses and they're trying so hard to like sell a product or a service. They completely forget about the human being that's on the other side who's maybe having a bad day at work or not sure what they want to do in their career next. Um, And so I have this sort of philosophy that like, you know, 99% of what I do is for free. And there's like 1% of it that I monetize and that helps me earn a living. But I don't need to make money off every single person or every single thing that I do. And so just that subtle shift away from this selfish kind of personal branding, look how good I am, look how great my life is, that's been, a, that's been huge for me. Um, and that's, that's the opportunity that I want everyone else to be able to access. Wow, that's profound. And, and when did you come to this realization that personal branding is really about ego and that you need to come at this with a kind of selfless perspective? Yeah, I got a bit of a look behind the scenes. So in the early days, I had a few blog articles that went really viral. And so what happened was I got added into a few of these LinkedIn groups with other content creators. And I started watching what was going on and like what they were posting and what was happening behind the scenes were like two different people. And there was all these sort of like wars behind the scenes of like who's getting the most likes and why didn't you like my thing? And and it just got really toxic. And I went, hang on, we're all doing it for the wrong reason if that's why you're here. Um, and so I just started pivoting away from this whole personal branding thing um, because it, just something about it just felt very selfish and, and self-centered. And I, I just don't like to treat people like that. If, if you walk through life and everything is transactional, you're going to have a really miserable life. Um, so for me, it's like just try and help other people with what they're doing. And uh, there's that famous quote, it's like, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Mm-hmm. And I kind of I kind of use that philosophy. Um and that's it. And that's how you and I met, Stefan. Like we're, we're not here trying to get anything out of each other. You know, if so, if an opportunity happens in the future, great. But that's not the reason for the connect. So it's just a different way of looking at things. And look who you get to meet when you have that approach, right? Yeah. You know, I got to share a story that uh, I'm going to circle back to making it uh, relevant to to business and and marketing. But the the idea of having something, doing something, being something that is meant to add value in the world, to, to make a difference, to reveal light, and not trying to do it to gain brownie points or get something out of it is, is so crucial. And I had a, an experience with that just last week in that I uh, had befriended the stray cat, and, and, and I'm in Tel Aviv currently, there are a lot of stray cats here. And uh, I would always feed it, brought a can of cat food with me. We'd go to this uh, appointment, me and my my wife and and baby. And my little one, he loved uh, when we would go across the street and see the cat there. And most of the time, she was there. So this one uh, week was different. This was last week. And she was obviously hurt. Something was wrong. She was... uh, very slow and couldn't seem to go down off of the area that she was at to get water. And so she looked really dehydrated, even though there was a big thing of water nearby and there was food down there as well. She didn't look like she was able to go and get it. Didn't know what happened if she was injured somehow. And I asked for guidance uh, from above and the answer I got was to take her to the vet. I've never taken an animal to the vet before. That was not mine. So that was a little bit of a stretch for me. And we were getting ready to move uh, back to the States, which is actually later today. We fly back. Uh, so, yeah, that was a, it was a big ask. I mean, it wasn't an ask. It was like I was asking, what do I do? How do I help? And the answer was, well, you got to get out of your comfort zone zone, and actually take the animal to the vet. And we did, and she had a, a, a pelvic fracture. Yeah, a lot of... Uh, uh, she would have died if I hadn't intervened. And later that day... No, it was the next day. I had an interview on the Kara Golden Show. 
Kara is amazing. She's been a, a guest on my other podcast on Get Yourself Optimized. She's the founder of Hint Water, uh, author of the new book, Undaunted. Amazing. And uh, it was before the recording started. I just mentioned this because it was very fresh. It was just happening. Uh, she said, you know, my mother always told me that you save a stray cat and you get a few years extra added to your life. And, w you know, when you hear things or you see things and things just pop for you, they just kind of, if you're reading it, it pops off the screen. It's like you, you get a repeating number. These are called angel numbers. And it just pops off the screen or off of a, a page or, or, or whatever. And that's a sign. That's a message. And for me, that popped off of the, uh, of the audio when she was uh, saying that. It felt like that was a message meant for me. I didn't do it to get a few extra years added to my life. I didn't do it to get brownie points uh, or uh, karma points in heaven. I just did it because if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? And yeah, it was really beautiful. It touched my, my, my heart, my soul when uh, Kara said that because I knew like how many people uh, uh, say something like that, have uh, a, a mother who always says that throughout a child's childhood and she passed that on to me I, I knew it was a sign or message uh, meant for me and you know it's just like a, a bonus it was really beautiful but that wasn't why I did it so I, I think translate that again to a work environment everything that you do um, is like a it has your signature on it and if that signature is done with this intent that's pure and and loving and i'm not talking about uh give to get sort of loving i'm talking about unconditional love like that's who you are that that's the kind of marketing i want to see in the world yeah and whether you call that law of attraction or whatever you want to label it you know i sort of describe it as it's a bit like a magnet you put out all this stuff into the universe and then it sort of it attracts the right people back to whoever might be interested in what you're doing. And I get these emails all the time from like random readers that say, you know, they, just, that they either felt something or they got some sort of positive vibe or whatever. And I just think, wow, if you just keep doing that, I just wonder where if you're putting out enough of that positive energy for long enough, like where does that lead? And I don't know, but so far it's led, you know, somewhere pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, there's no plan behind it. There's no marketing plan. There's no ROI. There's no, you know, deadline or any of that stuff. It's just, you know, this would be interesting if, if we did it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the approach. Yeah. Now you said you, you, you hit it out of the park and you didn't use that term, but you hit like a, a huge kind of home run type of uh, viral post or several or mm -hmm. early on. And I'm curious, what does that mean in terms of reach? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> um, so I probably would have had a, quite a few pieces that have done like 10 million views plus wow. what often happens is they transcend the platform. So I've had a couple on medium in the last year that have ended up on LinkedIn, not by me, just people have shared them on there and they've gone like mega, mega viral there. Um, and then in the early days I was posting like articles directly to LinkedIn using the, the article uh, feature. And I had a couple there. I think there was one I remembered very distinctly called like 16 things my successful friends did or something like that had successful friends in the title and it's in my screenshots somewhere, but like on LinkedIn, it had, you know, millions and millions of views just there. And then it ended up what, what normally happens when it goes that viral is people like business insider and CNBC and some of these bigger publica publications, they start to syndicate it. And so that's happened quite a few times. Um, and again, I don't think it's got anything to do with me. I just think more that if you're doing it for that long and you start to refine it and get it to a bit of an art form, it's kind of obvious that eventually something's going to pop. And um, that's why I just put out a lot of content and I don't worry too much about what does well and what doesn't. Um, every so week, so every every couple of weeks, I'll see something that pops and um, and that's good enough. Yeah. And, and when it pops like every week or a few weeks, is it what, over a million views or what, what what's the criteria that feels like it popped for you? Yeah, I think between 100,000 to 500,000 views is what I define now. Um, in the earlier days, the platforms probably had a little bit more organic reach than they do now. So it was easy to sort of get a one or a two million views 
you know, without too much issue. Um, not to say it's not possible now, it's just a lot harder because the social media platforms are obviously prioritizing ads. And so that's got to take up some of that organic reach. And on platforms like Medium, there are record numbers of content creators on there, particularly since COVID. And that just plays into the into it. But um, I don't really think about competition. Um, that's something that kind of frustrates me a bit when people start getting competitive. You can either do the marketing game as a team sport or you can do it as treating everyone like competitors. It's more fun to play as a team sport. So that's how I think of it. Yeah, so true. And uh, and there's a book called Coopetition. I have I never read it, but I always loved the title. So everybody is, is a coopetor, not a competitor. You can cooperate with them and collaborate and build something that's greater than if you just worked uh, alone and that person or a company worked alone as well. It's really a cool idea and one you can put into practice and I, I think create a lot of value in the world. Yeah, I mean, I do that with courses. So many of the other content creators I know, they want to offer courses, but for example, many of them are not LinkedIn experts. So they end up just becoming affiliates of my course because it's easier than trying to create their own. And so, you know, I could say, oh, they're competitors because we're all trying to do the same thing, but not really. And then, you know, vice versa, like they sometimes will give me writing gigs that they don't have time for. I might give them writing gigs that, you know, I don't have time for. And there's just so much of this kind of back and forth between everybody. It's really nice. And it's like everybody gets to eat. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and we're not trying to one up each other. And that's because we're not necessarily trying to, None of us are trying to buy Lamborghinis or anything. That's not the point of it. So when you don't have that philosophy, you're not trying to maximize the money. And then strangely enough, I don't know why it ends up working in reverse where you end up actually financially doing quite well without kind of trying, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's not a zero-sum game. And if you treat uh, everyone like they're uh, part of your tribe instead of someone else's uh, tribe, then the universe starts to just line things up for you. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now you're a top writer on medium and you have been for how many years? Oh, probably like five years. Yeah. Amazing. And the platforms changed pretty significantly, right? Because I, as a, as a consumer of content, I'm not writing on medium, but I do read occasionally articles on medium and it says, oh, you get X number of free articles and you've consumed one uh, or two or whatever of your three free articles for whatever time period. Now, I'm not tracking that. I just notice that. I don't seem to hit the, the maximum number because I'm not consuming much content. Um, so what does that uh, do for content creators in terms of the downsides as well as the upsides? Because... That's not always been that way. Yeah, about three years ago, Medium decided to change their business model. So in the old days, it was really just like a personal blog and the way you would monetize it is use like a call to action or a link in the bio to link people back to your website and then you might sell a product through there. And what they decided to do was move away from that and focus more on quality. And so what they started doing is um, they introduced the Medium Partner Program. So readers can buy a $5 a month uh, subscription um, to obviously access all the content unlimited and then for the writers they all get a share of that uh, five dollars per month now that started originally being based on i think it was views and last year they changed it to reading time so it's whoever gets the most meeting reading time gets paid the most so you might have the most amount of views on your article but if everyone's only staying for 30 seconds because it's clickbait then you're not going to do so well on the platform um, and then they also introduced a number of other measures to ensure that quality content was getting through and low quality content was essentially not getting much reach. And so again, if you don't understand how the platform works, you'll never be able to tap into its reach and you'll just end up in that basket where the majority of your work gets blocked. Um, and so I think that's where people struggle and it's not written anywhere. It's kind of like all unofficial. Um, well, it is, you can see it on the dashboard, but it's, yeah, there's no like FAQ that sort of points this out nicely for you. Um, so a lot of people that write on there tend to do a course and then they, that's how they figure out how to use it. Interesting. So the reading time reminds me of watch time on YouTube because that metric is the magic metric that if you can 
perform well in terms of watch time, everything else falls in place. But if you just are after the view counts, you'll probably not perform that well in, in, and in a way that uh, YouTube will recommend you as a suggested video over on the right hand side. So it's very, very, very important with YouTube to get uh, a lot of watch time with your videos and with the overall sessions, even if they're not watching just your videos, you'll get benefit from the session watch time as well as uh, the watch time of your video. So it seems like that might be uh, applied in a similar fashion on Medium, but for reading time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very similar. The, the other huge benefit that people don't often understand with Medium is even if you put it to one side, the monetization, Medium has probably some of the highest SEO anywhere in the world on any website. I mean, if you put something on there, even if it doesn't get very many views, from an SEO point of view, it's going to show up for those keywords very high in Google. And you'll see that with a lot of my articles. It's like, yeah, they're, they're only in Google because they're on Medium. If they're on my personal website, they wouldn't have those number one and number two rankings. And so if you forget about the monetization, you can just put your content up there. You can still link back to your website. They allow, it's quite generous actually. It's like up to 20% of the content can be a call to action. So you could have like quite a long thing at the end telling people what you do and, and linking to different products. So you can still do that. You can still earn money. Um, and yeah, just that SEO factor, the medium domain. So when you publish content on there, you get like a subdomain under medium. And because that, that domain has just so much authority, I, I did measure it once. I think it's like 90 out of 98 out of a hundred or something crazy. Um, that just helps your content get seen. And then in terms of reach at the moment, I did see they posted a graph recently of number of views per month and it's like hundreds of millions and it's increasing rapidly at the moment. So it's a really good platform, I think, if you are a content creator to, to get your head around and put content on. Um, yeah, there's obviously quite a few guidelines, you know, like you wouldn't, I wouldn't put a, a tweet size post on Medium personally. I would probably aim for kind of, you know, 700 words plus. Um, so those sort of best practices are yeah, quite obvious. Okay, so is there a list of these best practices somewhere, like 700 words uh, minimum? Sounds like a, a good idea to me as well. Uh, or do you really need a course on, on Medium no, to learn all this stuff? And I've actually given this feedback to Medium, and they are starting to change it, but as it stands today, it isn't, in my opinion, an intuitive platform, and it does have a lot of friction. Um, but each month as they do their updates, I am noticing it's getting better and better. So for me, like, you know, I, I did have to kind of learn the ropes a little bit and I did it the stupid way. I didn't do a course. I ended up wasting probably two years experimenting and trying to figure out how it works. If I had my time again, I would have just done a, done a course and probably got over and done with uh, much quicker. And that's how now, like I see people that just get on there within a few months, they're sort of having like, you know, some really successful posts. And when I ask them behind the scenes, like, oh, how'd you get that? Nine times out of 10, they've come through one of these courses. So um yeah so even i do courses like i do i've done medium courses like now later in the journey and i've even when i was um, preparing for my linkedin course i did other people's courses just to get a flavor for like what's the difference of the the content and what are maybe some of the other goals that people have outside of the ones that i'm i'm addressing myself and um yeah i think the the unfortunate one was that a lot of people are stuck on this personal branding one and thinking that, oh, I should do a course about personal branding. And I think that just comes with education. I do think that will shift. But right now, people are very focused on that as a goal. Yeah. Sell them what they want. You give them what they need. You know, that's a, kind of a an adage in marketing. And if somebody is selling a course or a package, a coaching or whatever on personal branding, which is what everybody wants, then they sell them or what they, they give them then is what they need, which is here's how to be altruistic and uh, value focused with what you do and not try to keep getting stuff in exchange. Try, you know, instead of feeding your ego so much and being selfish, how about X, Y, and Z instead? And that's, I think, how you can kind of give them the, the, the medicine after you've uh, baited them with the candy. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And this is one thing I've been trying to get into a number of the students' mind is that, um, you know, I've had posts, like we said before, that have done millions and millions of views. And I keep telling them that when that happens, 
it doesn't feel any different. Whether the dashboard says a thousand views or a million views, after a while, you just become numb to it. And same with the money side. People go, oh, you know, it might be great to make six figures off whatever that product is. And I say, look, to be honest, when I was making zero dollars as opposed to making six figures off different products, it doesn't feel any different. And the game never ends. Like it's never enough. Once you get a million views, it's happened to me. Then you have the craving for like, how do I get 10 million views? And so if that becomes your driving force, it, it gets really empty really fast. Um, and, and that's why I say for me, like the experience that I've had is that the best feeling is actually when you know you've helped someone. I've had many of these over the years, but like people that were suicidal or I had a guy a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, like basically lost everything. His business was in ruins, like he was about to get divorced and he read a bunch of articles and I think he got an ebook off me a few years ago. And I didn't even know, but he sent me an email one time and I replied just with a few things that might help him. And he replied back, he's like, oh, it's been like four years or five years or whatever it's been. And, um, you know, now everything's back on track. My marriage is better. We've just started a new business. It's booming. And you read that and you're like, God, this guy was like completely going down the wrong track. And, you know, a few silly blog posts and like a very short email for me and look what's happening. I've had others that are like literally say, look, I'm about to commit suicide. Things are really bad for me. And I go straight into my cool. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, what we need to do very urgently is kind of get you in touch with a professional. I'm going to be kind of your your one-to-one accountability partner to make sure you take these actions. It's really, really important that you do X, Y, and Z right now. Um, and, you know, like it's, it's worked. They've gone, they've got the, the treatment and they haven't gone and done the stupid thing. And it's like, wow, you know, who knew that a few blog posts on the internet had that power, right? Yeah. And that's more rewarding than than the dollars in my mind. Of course, yeah. Saving lives, it's beautiful. Well, congratulations on, on, on doing that and, and, and keep it up. Yeah, you're, you're doing uh, a, a lot of good in the world. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's a, a cool part of what we do. Um, and if you can tie back, you know, marketing, whatever it is that you do back to something like that, it's, uh, it's a heaps better feeling. Yeah. Is there a particular uh, blog post or, or piece that was the most impactful out of everything that you in your portfolio that's probably saved or changed the most lives? Yeah, there was one I posted very early on called, um, I think it was like 14 ways I completely changed my life and so can you. And so what happened was I started, I wasn't intending on being a writer, but I had a friend who had a blog and um, he said to me, look, I want to interview some startup founders and, you know, turn those into blog posts. And I said, look, you know, I know a lot of startup founders, but I'm not really a writer. And he's like, well, why don't you interview some of these startup founders that you know, record them as a, um, like a podcast through Skype, just record the audio, not the video. And then you can listen back to it and take notes and turn those into blog posts. And so I started doing that. And to be honest, you can still see them online. If you Google my name and go back like many, many years, you'll see them there. And they just kind of read like startup press releases and they were very focused around like what companies were raising what amount of money. So that's how I got started. Um, there was no self-improvement or any of that kind of stuff. And then one night I was really frustrated and I was a bit sick of it. And you know, I've had like a long battle at that point with mental illness and I'd kind of overcome a lot of that. And so I ended up just like writing a blog post around how I did that, how I switched that situation to something really positive and i didn't think too much there's a lot of spelling errors and stuff and i just put it up on the website on the same place that i was putting those um startup press releases which is a website called addicted to success and um and then i don't know why but like within a day or two it just went absolutely berserk and i went on facebook and it had eighty four thousand shares now just to put that in perspective that's not eighty four thousand likes or, or any of that that's actual people resharing the post um, and so still to this day, I don't think I've had anything that's been that successful. And I still get emails like years and years on um, from people that say like they found that really helpful. And I read back and go, you know, that was not the blog post wasn't that high quality now, I think, compared to some of the stuff that I can write. But there was just some sort of rawness about that. I think people could tell that like I'd gone from this desperate place and I was sort of transitioning into something else. And I think they could relate to that. Um, and so I often say like, you'd be surprised it's not necessarily about the quality of the content but how relatable it is to the situation that you're describing and you describe this kind of dire you know everything's kind of black and you don't know where it's going to go and you sort of lost all hope and people hear that and go oh that's how i felt um and so yeah the spelling errors and all that it's just it's so unpolished and i think 
I keep saying to people, people people want this sort of unpolished content that's raw. Um, and I think that's what I've become known for is just being able to produce that. Yeah. It's like the uh, on video as well. If it's highly produced, it looks like it came out of a Hollywood studio, it doesn't feel relatable. It doesn't feel genuine, uh, authentic. So, uh, yeah, you can't have poor audio quality with the video. You can and should be more kind of, I don't know, organic looking or kind of homemade in a way that makes you feel like a, like a human. And, and uh, how beautiful, authentic, and, and vulnerable of you to share that battle with, uh, with mental illness and, and and become so relatable to so many people so that you could change and, and, and save lives. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to, desc- to describe it, but it was sort of like torture. It's the worst feeling in the world. It's like your brain is constantly working against you. And it's almost the, the way I described in a blog post recently, it's like walking on earth and you don't trust gravity to keep you there. That's how it felt. You literally don't trust your own body to do the the things that you need to do. And maybe that's like, for example, at work, you might have a presentation. You know, you've got to be there a certain time. You've got to show up and you've got to talk. And I couldn't trust my own body to be able to do that. I'd be nervous. I'd be sweating. I'd be running to the bathroom. It just, it was a disaster, everything I tried to do. So you can imagine after decades and decades of doing that, you start to just kind of lose hope of like everything I try and do gets sabotaged and I don't know why. And I didn't know there was mental illness. Like it's not like anyone can sort of just diagnose it so i kept going to the doctor thinking maybe it was an eating disorder or a stomach problem all these different things and it's like no it was mental illness that's the i was witnessing the physical signs of like extreme mental illness and all it took was like to go see a psychologist and get the proper help and then after i was like oh my god why didn't i do this earlier and there's so many people that live with this they just don't know what to label it um and so that's been the frustrating part and that's why i keep sharing it and you know, lots of time in my corporate sort of career, people keep telling me, ah, you shouldn't talk about that. It makes you look weak and, you know, it makes you look too soft. And I'm like, yeah, but lots of people get value out of it because they're afraid to share their own kind of journey with that. So I don't know. I just suck it up and just deal with it. Yeah, beautiful. You know, uh, I had a, a situation happen just recently where somebody out of the blue messaged me on LinkedIn and thanked me for a post I wrote probably five years ago about imposter syndrome and how I suffered from, or or not suffered, that's not, that's too strong a word, but how I experienced imposter syndrome. And uh, he wrote in this post or in this uh, message to me that he couldn't find much information about imposter syndrome written from somebody who was successful and sharing their their journey and and their experience it was it was more just self help from a uh outside perspective right now here's what you do if you're uh, suffering from imposter syndrome and it didn't feel as relatable and so he got a lot of value and and help out of just reading this uh content i wrote it was a post on on the huffington post and and I also uh, created a uh, podcast episode, or I covered it in a podcast ep- episode on Get Yourself Optimized. It was the one with Alyssa Fisher-Harris where we went into that topic and I shared a bit of my journey. And uh, I, I don't know the degree of the impact, uh, but apparently was significant for him. And, and so out of the blue, somebody I'd never heard of spoken to realized i had helped or assisted with that article um messaged me to thank me and ask for more resources and uh yeah i did i gave him some things that would uh, help him on his journey so yeah we, we're more powerful yeah. than we can possibly imagine and what you do in like how you do one thing is how you do everything and if you're fr- coming from a place of uh selflessness and and unconditional love like that that leaves a mark in everything that you do yeah i think um stefan one of the challenges i've seen with self-improvement is you know naturally when you've had a little bit of success in whatever field you might get people to try and mimic some of the things that you do and i see that a bit on some of the platforms 
Um, but the thing they're always missing with self-improvement is they just tell you the, the normal story of like imposter syndrome, which has been written about before, but there's no personal narrative. So it doesn't make it relevant. It's just basically sharing facts. And then that person that wrote that goes, oh, why didn't anyone read it? You know, why is it not getting the engagement? And it's like, look, there's probably a number of reasons, but nine times out of 10, it's just because that story is just not there. It's missing. And if you haven't had that experience, you can't really write about it. And yeah, you can maybe try and weave in like a celebrity's experience or whatever, but it's not the same as when you've actually endured it. And that's the missing ingredient to a lot of content. It's just that personal touch of you have been doing the thing that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what's the expression? Facts tell, stories sell, something along that <laughs> lines. Correct. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, there's lots of people writing about those stories, but they just there's no story. And the more you are willing to go outside of your comfort zone and be vulnerable the more lives you'll impact, the more uh, reach, the more all, all the kind of side benefits happen. But then it's pretty scary for people. For me, when I wrote that Huffington Post article and I got some great feedback about it, I even got uh, a, a, an email out of the blue from Psychology Today, uh, the magazine, and they wanted to write about me in an article about uh, imposter syndrome and they uh, I said okay I guess you, you can interview me and, and then they're like oh we actually want to we want to make you the cover image for the article I mean for the uh, for that issue wow. and then I'm like Oh, ho, ho, that's um, the yeah, poster boy for imposter syndrome, and I bailed. Oh, I bailed. What a good opportunity, and you missed out, right? Well, I don't know how many lives I would have saved or changed by putting myself out there to that uh, to that level. But at the time, this was probably five years ago. Uh, I didn't want to be known as the poster boy for imposter syndrome. And I, I, I got scared. I got cold feet. So I said no. Yeah, and that, and that's common, Stefan. And I, I keep saying like the different levels that I've reached as a writer is exactly what you're talking about with the vulnerability, and it's really hard. And there's a few of us in the writers group, and we have this thing where we say, you know, if you didn't feel a little bit uneasy when you published it, you probably didn't push it far enough. So now the pieces I'm looking for are the ones where I hit publish. And it's really uncomfortable. And this happens a lot, especially in the last few months. I've had many where I've gone, oh, you know, if my boss at work reads this or a family member or something, it's going to be really uncomfortable. And it's just, you just build it. It's like, the, like a courage muscle. You just keep working it and eventually you get further and further. Um, and so, you know, that's another like secret technique that some people use. And once you understand stand that, if you can tap into it, it's very, very powerful. But it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That reminds me of a, a tool that I learned probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago while reading the book called The Tools. A beautiful, amazing book written by a couple of, of psychologists. And uh, there are five tools in this book. And one of them is how to face your fears. It's a very powerful visualization, but very simple. You visualize the fear... Let's say for me it was uh, being on the cover of uh, of Psychology Today. You f you just imagine that as this cloud of black dust in front of you, and you don't just face the fear; you run to and through it. You run towards the fear and you run straight through it to the other side. And, and so you visualize yourself doing that, and the way this this came about this, this tool was uh, one of the co-authors had a really good friend in high school who was like all state in football. He was an incredible, uh, very, very successful athlete, but he wasn't all that athletic. And, and uh, the, the co-author, he couldn't figure out like how, well, what's your secret to success? And he, 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 uh, the, the friend confided in him and said, well, I just go out there and get tackled, like pummeled as quickly as I can. And then I become invincible the rest of the game. 
So I will go run straight towards the biggest uh, uh, opponents on the other team who are going to tackle me and crush me. And he wasn't a very big guy. So he just ran uh, right in, right into the fear, right to the uh, to the biggest players uh, when he got the ball, and and that first uh, interaction on on the uh, on the field, and he became invincible the rest of the game. So the co-author turned that into uh, a, an exercise, which he would have his patients, his clients use, and then. He got all the success uh, for them, and then he decided to include it in the book. What a what a cool example of something that you just learn in passing through your life, uh, some life lesson, and then you turn it into something that millions of people can use. It's like what you've done, and and you're using that courage muscle all the time. You're running straight to the fear and through it, and saving lives. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think the other way I think of it as well is like, what can you, what can you link it back to? So I always think of this mortality thing and I go, all right, so I've got this fear and it's very scary, but in comparison, nothing, none of it really matters. So if we, if we rewind back to that 2015 moment, I mentioned that sort of near miss with cancer, just by pure luck, I happened to see a second doctor and they happened to find out what was going on. But had I have not done that, you know, it probably would have been a pretty dire situation. So I go, okay, well, you may not have even made it to this point where you're at now. So what, what have you got to lose? You're not getting any younger. You know, when you're gone one day, no one's going to remember all these little things. They're not spending their days on earth thinking about you and your brand. And they're just not thinking about them. They're thinking about themselves. So 99% of what you do is not even going to be noticed or remembered. So when I when I remind myself of that, I can push through some of these fears, um, and that's that's all there is. Like you can make a really cool impact if you can if you can push through these fears, or you can hide and be scared, but you're just losing, and then in the end you'll die and you'll just be re- regretting the fact that you didn't do all those things. So that's how I kind of get through it. Yeah, yeah. Regret is is not not fun. <laughs> nah. Yeah. No. Now are are there any tactical or kind of logistical uh points that you want to make about uh the the posting like frequency and i know length would be 700 words would be more of a a, a minimum is there a maximum uh for a, a medium post do you always post the same post to your blog or do you have to change it uh, yeah a few different things like that that i'm, I'm curious okay. about Um, So definitely the frequency. I think you need to be posting at least one story a week. Now, I post 10. I'm not recommending anyone does that. But uh, yeah, at least one so you can show the algorithms and the platforms that you're you're there and you're alive. Um, So that's the first thing. You know, definitely like a solid image that's at the front that sort of captures people and helps, you know, remind them what the article's about. I see a lot of posts where they'll be talking about something, but the picture's got nothing to do with it. Um, when you can have a, a picture that relates to the headline, that's important. Um, not using clickbait titles. Medium doesn't allow clickbait. If you do that, you could be shown by. Um, you won't have your posts shown to many people. Uh, unfortunately, they don't really tell you what is and isn't clickbait. You just have to use your own intuition. Um, so that's key as well. Um, you know, I would recommend that you link back to an email list so you can build your email list. Uh, you can. You mentioned before post on your blog first. And then you can use, and I'm going to stuff up the way you say it, uh, canalocal links. Yeah, canonical. <laughs> canonical links. Um, so Medium allows those. Um, I don't personally do it very often because one of the problems with that is you might post something on your blog first and then post it on Medium, say, a day later. And the problem is Medium's algorithm is always looking for the freshest, newest content. So when you do that, you're, <coughs> you're sort of showing um, that your content is not the newest um, and I don't think, I, I don't think that's ideal. That's my personal opinion. Um, that's what I've experienced. So that, that's a decision you have to make. So out of my 10, I might do one a week that goes on my own blog and then gets reposted to medium. And I try and make sure the time that I post at the time it goes on medium is not too far apart. So that way medium is still seeing it as a fairly fresh post. Um, so that's an- another important piece. 
Um, you know, Medium is definitely like a PG platform. So, you know, no sexual content, no sexual images, no pictures of guns, um, no sort of conspiracy theories, no uh, sort of hate posts against a particular person. If you're going to talk about a problem, you need to present a solution. You can't just go in there and sort of be angry about Donald Trump. You've got to actually, you know, say, what is the solution to this problem? Um, ideally, you finish the blog post, you know, so it sort of ties back to the headline or to the initial intro. Some people don't. They sort of just leave it in midair. That's not uh, really best practice on Medium. Uh, you need to make sure it's free of spelling errors. So, you know, I use a tool like Grammarly to do that. Um, you don't want to like put a whole bunch of images through the post so it sort of looks like an ad. You want to kind of, kind of make the reading experience uh, nice and neat and tidy and not overdo it with lots of pictures and diagrams because it is very much a writing platform, not a writing and photos platform, um, like, say, Instagram as an example. Um, and, yeah, just making sure that your titles are not random things like, you know, I, saw, I see a couple of these. It'll say, like, on marketing, on self-improvement. That's not really a title that's going to engage someone or make them want to click your post. Um, so again, just subtle curiosity around what they might get out of your post is key. Um, and then above the headline, you've got an opportunity for a subtitle. A lot of people don't use subtitles. I definitely do. Um, and if you look at how posts get displayed in the media map, all you can see is the headline, the subtitle, and the image. So you want to make sure that those three things are bang on. Um, and if you're not using a subtitle, well, you're missing one out of the three opportunities that you have to get a reader's attention. Um, so normally I use the subtitle like a second headline, but going into a bit more detail around is this research back? Who might you hear about in this post? Um, you know, something that's a bit more detailed. And sometimes you can be really vague in the, the headline and put all the detail in the subtitle or be really detailed in the headline and just be really vague in the subtitle. So there's a lot of tricks, but I think, yeah, all of those techniques together are, are the best practices for Medium for sure. Wow, those are fantastic. Uh, now about the image, is that something that you find on a stock photo site like pexels.com or Unsplash, or is it something that you take a photo uh, with your own camera? Um, so I use a lot of Unsplash images. In the last few months, I have started using more and more images that are taken with my iPhone. And I've actually noticed those posts seem to perform a lot better. And I think back to what we were saying before, it's just me taking a photo on my iPhone, you can just tell that it's not like a perfect stock image. It just has this rawness about it. Um, and so especially if it's something about me or mental health or that type of thing, um, yeah, those images definitely work a lot better. So I would strongly encourage anyone that's listening to this that, you know, if you've got your own camera, don't be afraid to use it. It doesn't have to be photos of you. It could just be photos of like holidays you've been on or places you've gone to. Um, so I think a mixture. Um, but yeah, Unsplash is definitely my go-to place. Yeah, got it. You know, I learned this uh, technique from Andy Crestedina years ago of the evil twin, which is simply this. If you have an article that you've written for, let's say it's Medium, it could be, I don't know, Inc. Magazine or, or Entrepreneur.com or wherever, uh, but you've got this uh, article that you've written for one place and you're not allowed to repurpose it for your own blog, your own website. You create an evil twin, meaning like if it's the seven best practices that all billionaires uh, implement in their daily routine, you just flip it. The seven biggest mistakes that uh, unsuccessful entrepreneurs always make that the billionaires never do. And, yep. and, and you uh, base it on the same research. You don't just paraphrase, you, you rewrite it. But it's a lot faster to rewrite an article based on the research you've already done and create that evil twin than it is to start from scratch. And if you only post to the other platform and not to your own, you know, to earned media but not owned media, then you're missing an opportunity. So I really liked that uh, approach. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, so this is something I do a lot, Stefan. Um, and I think using data now as a writer is, is fundamental. So I'll give you a couple of exa examples of how I do that. So I definitely rewrite blog posts. I do that all the time, but I don't look at the previous one. I just look at the headline. 
Um, and then I basically just write it from scratch. And it's not it never even close to the original. So that's an easy one. Um, when it comes to headlines on LinkedIn and on Twitter, I am often testing headlines. People don't know it. Um, but I'll look to see like what gets engagement and try and work out you know, what could be good. So some of my best tweets become headlines. Some of my best headlines have become tweets. Um, and I do that with subtitles as well, back and forth. Um, any LinkedIn post that I have that does well ends up as a medium blog post. So those 1300 character posts will become a blog post. Vice versa, if I have something that does well on medium and it's got a work or a business uh, context to it, I will definitely write a LinkedIn update with some of that as the inspiration. Um, so with Medium, another thing you can do is you can highlight your favorite sentences um, and they get stored on your Medium account. And you can also, this is a really cool feature that a lot of people don't know, you can see what your followers have highlighted within your content. And so I can go to an article and I can see what was the most highlighted line of that article. And guess what? That makes for a great tweet. It makes for a great headline in itself. It makes for a great LinkedIn status makes it uh, for a great ebook title. So constantly I'm using data to sort of <clears throat> refine what I'm doing. Um, wow. And so that's that's something that everyone can do. That's brilliant. I love that. And that reminds me that Kindle has a similar feature where it shows you the really highlighted little bits in a book. So if you have a book that you've published on Kindle, you can go in just as a user of your own book and see where those highlighted uh, elements are. Yeah, that's Yeah, great. and what's cool about these highlights is they're public. So even if you're not logged into Medium, you can see what the top highlight is on every article and it points it out really clearly. And I'm fascinated. Like I've been watching these for seven years and I've seen so many patterns over the years of like, what are the top highlights? What makes a good top highlight? And a couple of just insights is like, sometimes it's often a short sentence it's typically not like a long paragraph in my experience. Um, normally, the point they're making that sentence is really simple. It might be something simple like, so wake up tomorrow at 5 a.m. and drink a liter of water. That's it. And you would think, ah, that's nothing amazing. But for whatever reason, it's those little nuggets, especially if it's actionable, they seem to be very well highlighted. Um, yeah, what else is there? Uh, it's something that's got like an interesting sort of metaphor in it. So I saw one about like gaslighting and it had like a final sentence around like, you know, America is gaslighting you or something like that. And, and then I had that as the top highlight. So, yeah, I, I, I encourage everyone to study top highlights. You'll learn a lot about writing and what people are interested in by doing it. Yeah. Fabulous. OK, well, we're out of time. So, so where do we send our, our listener to get your LinkedIn course, your other courses, uh, potentially to work with you. I, I believe you do ghostwriting as well. So if you're uh, uh, available for that, where do they uh, reach out to you to potentially hire you to do some ghostwriting? Yeah, sure. Um, so Stefan, we might put in maybe the uh, show notes, but I've got a, um, a LinkedIn course. I'll put, we'll put a link in there. It's hosted on Teachable. Um, but if you want to access it, it's not something that's publicly available. So you'd need to join my email list and we obviously talk about it on there. So you can do that at timdenning.com. Um, and so my last name is D E double N for Nelly, I N G.com. And you'll see as soon as you go there, right on the homepage, you can just leave your email address. And once you're on there, you'll then get access to all the eBooks and online courses. A lot of it is free to be honest. Um, so I've actually got like a free medium course. I'm making a free LinkedIn course at the moment. Um, and I've had feedback already that people say, oh, you know, why did you put the best lessons in the free one? I don't know. It's fun to give away stuff that people find valuable for free. So, um, yeah, that's where you can find it, Stefan. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not only uh, good karma to give your best stuff away for free. It's actually good marketing. And I, I learned this from Frank, Frank Kern. He says, give results in advance. If you have an entire course on playing the guitar and you give away lessons on how to, for example, play the F chord, which is a challenging chord to play, they feel that sense of success, that, that feeling of uh, what B.J. Fogg refers to as shine, which is actual emotion of, of feeling progress and success. And then they associate it with not just the lesson, but the entire course. So when they look back on the course that they paid for that included all the free stuff that they already had consumed, they lump it all together and say, wow, that was really good value for money. Yeah. That is exactly spot on, Stefan, exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that approach. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Tim Denning.com, D E N N I N G. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, going to be a great resource for folks and they'll, they'll join your email list and get access to all that, uh, uh, secret content. And then on social media, I'm guessing that your, your handle is probably Tim Denning as well. Yeah. Everything's Tim Denning. So okay. you'll find me pretty easily. You can Google search it. You'll see it. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tim. This was so good. So, so good. And I, and it was inspiring. Uh, how often do you listen to a marketing show that's inspirational? I think this is fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Stefan. All right. Now, listener, take some action and do some good in the world. And we'll catch you on next week's episode.